speaker today, Curtis Bolin from uh, Quantenuum. Um, so, uh, Curtis was uh, formerly a PhD student in environmental sciences. And uh, so, he got his BS in applied and engineering physics from Cornell, and then he got his PhD in optical science, sciences in 2000. Um, he did his PhD work in snapshot imaging for spectroscopy, I believe. That was his PhD thesis. Spectrometry, yeah. Spectrometry. And then he went on to uh, the Georgia Tech Research Institute um, and was sort of born again in 2005 with the emergence of sort of uh, quantum computing as a uh, sort of a, uh, a engineer in uh, quantum science. So he helped co-found the, co -found the Quantum Systems Group at Georgia Tech Research Institute in 2005. And in 2020, he uh, went on to uh, work with Honeywell Quantum Solutions, which has recently become uh, Quantenuum. And he sort of used uh, his expertise in engineering, physics, and optics um, to uh, help build better um, ion trap quantum computers, which is something we'll hear about today. So he's an example of one of sort of the first generation quantum systems in here. Okay. Thank you very much. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dalton. Um, so uh, this is a pretty dense presentation. I hope I can uh, crank my way through it. But um, uh, the, the main effort here is to, is to cover the more engineering side of what is uh, something that also gets covered here extensively on the quantum information side with, with physicists and theorists. But, but I am definitely trained as a classical uh, optical systems designer. Uh, my actual work in this field is around the ion trap design itself, which is more of an electrostatics problem. Uh, but uh, because of the, the ubiquity of optics in this field, uh, I do get to do a fair bit of, of work on the uh, you know, planning and architecting of, of how uh, optics are integrated with the systems. Um, I would say the, the five pictures on the top aren't necessarily representative of everything that happens with ion traps. Uh, but but several you know at least a couple of them have sort of a laser or a or a or MEMS type looking thing in it that that gives you the sense that ion trap quantum computing is really heavily into optics. So uh, the the outline today is just to to give a really deep background on why we want to make quantum computers at all, uh, and then the next step is to say. So you want to make a quantum computer, why would you make one with trapped ions? There are lots of options out there. There's, there are plenty of companies making quantum computers with other quantum bits. So why, why am I working in ions? Uh, and then I have a, a bunch of slides that, that kind of go through the, the elemental operations of, of what you, how you, you trap and control the information in ions uh, with, with laser light uh, and photonics. Um, and, then, and then a handful of slides at the end that just take snapshots of, of where uh, the serious engineering problems lie uh, in terms of optics with, with going forward and making bigger quantum computers. Um, and, and that's probably the most glamorous picture I'm going to show you this entire slide deck. It's quite pretty. Uh, I have no idea how they made that. There's actual information in there about, about some of the work we do. And so the slide's at the end, and I'll, hopefully I can point it out to you there. But there's no ion trap. Normally there would be a huge vacuum chamber up here. And it's just missing in this picture. So this is probably our optical test lab. And they've just pointed things at the center to make a pretty picture. So why quantum computers? Um, and I, it, it's a really hypey field right now. You can hardly open any sort of uh, you know, public, publicly consumed uh, science uh, type uh, environment and not see you know, just breathless speech about how quantum computing is going to revolutionize the world. And, control the stock market and all this sort of stuff. But so what is a quantum computer? Uh, it, rather than you know, classical bits, a quantum computer is just a computer that, that stores and processes information in quantum states. Uh, and so um, it is not just uh, a faster classical computer, right? We're not trying to jump onto uh, the Moore's law curve and make uh, silicon uh, you know, gates obsolete, right? This is this is a, what I construe as a, as a reputable publication here. Uh, <laughs> and these are a couple of quotes from there that I think really describe 
why we're interested in quantum computing. It is, it is a different model of computing. Uh, and, and in this case, as the quote says, in much the same way that quantum mechanics is a more general model of physics than classical mechanics. And, and I think the quote that really stood out to me is one to say that of all the things that you see that say, you know, blank computing, uh, this quantum computing is absolutely the only one that is a completely different model of how computation happens. Uh, everything else is just sort of rearranging classical computation. Uh, okay. So, uh, you know, as I said, we're working with, with um, quantum bits. And so uh, these, this precise control of these quantum bits, uh, in, in principle, right, uh, hopefully allows us to pursue uh, several new regimes of applications. Uh, the most obvious one and the one that I think that gets the most talk is, is this concept of massively parallel computing where there, there are certain algorithms that just don't scale well on classical computers uh, or are not solvable at all on classical computers. Uh, and there are algorithms that exist for um, quantum computers that, that in principle scale perhaps linearly with the problem size as opposed to exponentially. There, there's, I would say there's not vast evidence that that's true right now, uh, and, and it may take a while to realize that, but, but that's the hope. Um, we can definitely uh, do more efficient simulation of quantum systems in much the same way that you know, classical computers are great for, for doing classical uh, simulations. Uh, you, you, need, you really need a quantum computer to, to approach the amount of information uh, that's required to simulate quantum systems. Um, you're all familiar with, with the uh, CQN, Center for Quantum Networks, that exists here. Uh, it, secure communications, quantum communications, those, those things uh, require some um, quantum memory, which is, which is kind of a, uh, related to quantum computing pretty closely. Um, there are uh, applications that take quantum sensors, which can achieve uh, uh, measurement sensitivities way beyond classical, you know, in principle, and actually network them together uh, to, to create sensitivity that is, that is even more uh, than what can be accomplished um, classically. And I think of, of all the things I've stated here, uh, perhaps that's the one where there's actually like a single bit of evidence that that's true, right? We have LIGO, where we've used squeeze light to, to achieve a sensitivity in a measurement that, that you would not have achieved otherwise. That's not quantum computing. Uh, it's just sort of, you know, maybe a, a transistor uh, demonstration towards saying there, there's something to quantum that we're actually going to realize uh, advantages in, in practical systems. Uh, and finally, like, there, there's this hope that, that we'll, we'll advance progress in, in fundamental physics. I don't, I don't know that we really can... Uh, we really understand the nature of coherence and are there any like physical limitations on coherence in nature? And one way to find out is to, is to, to push the boundaries, is to, to, uh, to create these, these giant coherent states and see if, see if we run into any new physics along the way. Okay, so talking about quantum bits, uh, you all understand how classical bits work. You have a one and a zero. Uh, so with a single quantum bit, we have a, a, a zero state. Um, I don't know if I have a pointer or not. Yeah, we, have, we have a zero state that we denote that way, and we have a one state that we denote that way. But the state lives in, in superposition, right? Rather than being all the way in one or all the way in the other, we have some alpha and beta, uh, and, and we can be in between, right? That's the concept of superposition. And we just have some normalization where the sum square uh, is one. And these, these numbers can be complex so that so we have what's called a block sphere, which, which is a representation of that in, in uh, you know, a vector on the surface of this sphere. Uh, those of you who have taken some optical engineering course are, are familiar with uh, Poincaré sphere describing polarization. That, that is simply the block sphere of a single photon polarization state. Uh, so we have you know, circular on top and bottom and left and right on the other axis and, and the two diagonals on the third axis. Uh, same thing. Uh, uh, just different word for what it is. Um, when we have two qubits, uh, you can write the state as this uh, separable product, right? So the first 
bracket, alpha 1 and beta 1 describe the first qubit, and alpha 2 and beta 2 describe the second qubit, uh, those are unentangled, right? Those are just two separate superpositions. Um, but we can also multiply that out, right? And imagine you have an alpha, beta, and a gamma, and a delta that are describing the four possible states, right, uh, of those two qubits together. Uh, only you can't factor it anymore, right? There's no alpha 1, beta 1, alpha 2, beta 2 that, that combine to make that second expression. That's, that's called entanglement, right? Because we can't express the state of either one of those particles or, or whatever is representing that without describing both. And then we have the state of maximal entanglement uh, where essentially they're 100% they're entangled, right? The state of one absolutely and uniquely determines the state of the other. Uh, and you're, you're, you're familiar with that uh, from popular literature. They call it like spooky action at a distance. I can have uh, a photon at a satellite and a photon down here uh, in, a, in a lab and they're entangled together even though they're, they're hundreds of kilometers apart and those, those sorts of demonstrations are done, done, I wouldn't say regularly, but they're done now. Uh, so then when you have n qubits, this is where things start to get uh, interesting, right? Rather than, than scaling in some sort of linear way, the number, total number of states, the total number of coefficients goes like 2 to the n. We have this exponential increase in the amount of information uh, with the number of, of bits that we have or qubits. We can still talk about this sort of maximally entangled state, right? Where, where every single one of my n objects is either in one state uh, or the other, and, and there are lots of words for for, um, for what you can call that state. Cat state uh, is one of them, uh, and uh, and those are interesting states. Um, from a, they often come up in sort of proof of concept experiments. So one of the key caveats of quantum information, uh, and one of the, the the big limiters of what we can accomplish algorithmically, is that we can't we can't measure the state of our system. Uh, without collapsing it, right? When we measure a state that is a superposition of, of alpha and beta, I've lost my cursor, there it is. When we measure a state that's, that's a single qubit and has alpha and beta, we only get a probabilistic outcome. So, so when we measure that qubit, we get zero with a probability of alpha squared, or we get beta with a probability, or sorry, one with a probability of beta squared. Uh, and, and so we've lost information in doing the measurement if, if our qubit wasn't in the measurement basis. Um, when we have two qubits, you just have then four probabilities of the measurement, right? We measure both in zero with the probability of alpha squared and, and so on and down the line. And when you have a maximally entangled state, of course, half the time uh, both particles are zero and half the time both particles are one. Uh, and there, there are a couple of terms that are associated with this, uh, the, the wave function collapse being one of them, the other one being this no cloning theorem, right? That's the, the, the theorem that essentially says we can't take quantum information and just duplicate it many times, right? That's not a, that's not, that's normally what we do in order to suppress noise, but, but we simp simply can't do that here, right? That's, that's one of the, one of the things that puts serious constraints on, on what a useful algorithm is for quantum information. At the end of this algorithm, we, we kind of have to engineer it so it returns us to answers that are pure states uh, that we can measure and get a unique answer in one run, say, or maybe a small number of runs. Um, it also makes it difficult to engineer a robust quantum environment, right? Anything that accidentally reads out one of our bits along the way potentially destroys everything that our quantum computer is doing. Uh, and makes it much more difficult to get to, to an answer successfully. So that's the background for quantum computing. So now why, why trapped ions? So there are lots of ways of implementing a qubit, and I just have a list here. It's probably far from complete, but the obvious one and the one I think that gets the most uh, work here, uh, if, if you're not in Paul's lab, is, is photons, right? And there, there are many things you can do with a photon uh, in order to, to to encode some kind of quantum information. Uh, you can obviously do polarization states. You can do number states, like how many, how many photons are in a cavity or a mode. Uh, frequency and time of arrival are also ways of, of encoding quantum information, and often those, are, those can be entangled with ions, actually. Uh, I think this is just a single photon generator that you can buy. 
uh, makes makes a single photon that you can make a bit of. That's uh, I think this is from a Chinese group. This is a multiplexer that gives them like 20 different, I think, effectively qubit channels uh, for their their photon quantum computer. And so this is just the input multiplexer. And they've got some nonlinear things where they do gates. Uh, and then they've got an output multiplexer that just looks like that, that maps you onto a bunch of detectors. Uh, and so things get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Uh, single electron spin. Um, not much else to say about that, that I don't think anybody's actually implementing that necessarily, but there are lots of hypotheses out there. Single atoms, um, so these are neutral atoms, uh, typically stored in, in uh, 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 optical uh, tweezers or, or far off resonant traps. Uh, and you know, within atoms, we can store information multiple ways, be it the electronic state, nuclear spin state. Uh, Single ions, uh, these are just atoms that are charged. Uh, and so the, you know, the ways we can make qubits are very similar. Uh, there's, a, there's an ion trap from, from ion Q with a string of, of single ions. Each dot is a single ytterbium atom. Um, single molecules or ionic molecules, that's much the same as, as single atoms, uh, except you can also potentially use like vibrational modes of the atoms. Um, like NMR was an early example where they did did some some proof of concept, but but was not scalable, and you know it's hard to it's hard to find essentially closed systems. I'll talk more about that later, where you can actually encode information and read it out in those. But people are working on it. Quantum dots, this is virtual atoms. Uh, we make you know a, a, a well in uh, an electron hole pair in in silicon, or we take a vacancy in some material like diamond uh, and and get a an electron hole pair out of it that we can make into a qubit. Superconducting Josephson junctions is really a stretch for me. I have no idea what they're doing here. Uh, and, and to some extent, maybe there's some optics in here. These are microwave waveguides that, that are coupled to their qubits that, that let them do uh, read out. Uh, so maybe something optical, certainly MEMS, right? They're manufacturing these things uh, in, uh, in fabrication facilities. Uh, and there are lots of ways to encode the state in those, and and maybe you know if you really want to stretch it, uh, there you can have these nanomechanical devices and cantilevers, and there's actually you know a paper where they they show uh, entanglement between between these two um, devices. Uh, a lot of these involve optics uh, in order to control the state or or some aspect of of trapping the the atoms or or what have you, uh, and, and, but not all of them, right? Just because you're working in quantum computing, perhaps you, you have no need for optics whatsoever because because you're doing you know uh, quantum dots, say. Okay, so there's there's kind of a, a level of complexity argument here. Uh, down at the bottom are, are sort of uh, qubits that we create by engineering them, uh, you know, making making holes in in semiconductors. Uh, um, making Josephson junctions in order to have a qubit, and obviously nanomechanical devices were, were, takes a lot of time and work to make those. Uh, up above are all the things that just have a qubit that's highly reproducible, right? Every, every electron I get is exactly the same, and, and controlling its state is going to be identical. Uh, and so there's, you know, there's a level of complexity argument there. Uh, but you know, there's there's the opposite argument is is maybe it's you know easier to engineer the features we want in the ones down at the bottom. Uh, ions being up above, we 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 like to to say you know, every every ion we trap is exactly the same, so we don't have to worry about that side of things. Why would we pick one of those technologies over the other? Uh, fortunately, somebody was nice enough to publish a paper back in 2000 and and give these criteria uh, for how you would select. Uh, an optimal qubit for a quantum computer. Uh, even though he published this, uh, no one has, has agreed yet on, on how to interpret these. Uh, and everybody has their own idea of which qubit to use. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, at least five or six of those technologies on the previous page have a, a company uh, you know, that is working on, on building a quantum computer with that technology right now. Uh, but the, the, the criteria are essentially like, can you find a qubit? Is it scalable, right? That's the first one. That seems pretty obvious, right? Uh, can you initialize the state in some controllable way? 
a lot of these technologies, um, we can only sort of probabilistically uh, um, initialize the qubit, right? We can't create a pure initial state uh, with our with our chosen qubit, um, and that's that's not a good start. Uh, and then um, you the the qubit has to have long decoherence times, right? It has to be able to survive uh, a long time, uh, much longer than any of the interaction times uh, for the quantum operations. Uh, universal set of quantum gates is we're all familiar with the concept of a Turing machine in, in classical computers. You have to be able to do have a general set of operations that lets you represent any possible operation. And the same is exactly true for, for quantum computers. You have to be able to do uh, the, the equivalent of a not gate, right, is, is state flipping within a single qubit. And you have to be able to do entangling operations, which is, which is doing conditional operation on one qubit, depending on the state of another, um, something like an XOR gate or an AND gate or something like that, although uh, all, all quantum operations are reversible. Um, so XOR gate, I think, is a better example. And then the last one is we have to be able to measure our qubit, right? At the end of our algorithm, we have to be able to uh, to determine which state it is in. Um, and yeah, so I'll get more to that later. So why, why pick trapped ions based on these criteria? Uh, so first thing is, you know, and I say this today, uh, this probably wasn't true 15 or 20 years ago, ions are really not that hard to, to trap, right? We're using technology that admittedly won a Nobel Prize uh, due to work back in the 50s, which was only 70 years ago. So it must have been hard, but, but over the years, like there's been a, a lot of investment in in understanding that technology, and nowadays you can, you know, you, you can find ion trapping groups in undergraduate physics research programs. <laughs> it's not that difficult. Uh, we have a, a list of, of relatively simple and mature, I would say, physical realizations for every operation I talked about on the previous page. Uh, you know, all of these were done. You know, by David Wineland, at least, if not by other groups, in slightly different ways. Um, and, and again, a Nobel Prize was awarded for work done essentially as recently as 1995. So we're only talking less than 30 years ago now. But but these are well understood. They work very well. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the final way of expressing how well they work is is to make a bunch of ratios. Right? You have what's called a coherence time, T1 is usually represented, which is if I prepare my state as a one or a zero, like how long does it stay that way uh, all on its own? Um, there are other ways of representing coherence time. There's, unsurprisingly, there's T2, which essentially says, you know, if I start flipping back and forth between my bits, how many times can I do that? Or how long can I do that before, before I lose track of which state I'm in? Uh, and, and if you, sort of express the ratio of, of how long it takes to do every single operation where the, the gating operations are usually the slowest. Uh, if you express that ratio in terms of the lifetime, for ions we get numbers that are 10 to the 5 or bigger, meaning we can do hundreds of thousands or millions of operations in principle before, before the ion loses coherence or, or we lose track of the state. In practice it's not, not that long, but because those those super long like 10 second coherent times are usually in systems that that aren't perfectly compatible with like you know the high fidelity gate operation that only takes microseconds or tens of microseconds but but the the flip side to that is like when you go to quantinium we have a computer you can rent time on where the entire operation right from from state preparation to doing an algorithm to read out uh, is, is many hundreds of times less than the coherence time of the ion. So we can do that with reasonably high probability. And I would say amongst all the technologies you've seen, um, the statements down there at the bottom are pretty uniquely true of ions. Most of the other implementations have some kind of serious flaw in, in one of those criteria that makes them very difficult to, to, uh, to really scale up at this point or to, to do effective computation. An example is atoms. So most of the time when you do read out with atoms, uh, you actually eject the atom from the trap. <laughs> and so then you have to go and load a new one in order to do another computation. Yes? So when you do one of these 
decoherence basically the, you know, the qubit talking to the environment and getting perturbed. And then errors in the active control, you're applying you're applying some sort of field to drive this gate. Mm -hmm. right? Getting that precisely accurate as well. Not trivial. No. So what dominates in in this system? Does it vary from implementation to implementation? Oh, you mean just within ions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there, there's lots of ways of encoding uh, information into two states of an atom, uh, or you know, into into a, even a single calcium ion, for instance. There's multiple states I can choose, and some of them might be more sensitive to the others, right? I can choose a state that has no magnetic field dependence, a clock state, and, and maybe then I don't, I'm not as sensitive to the magnetic field. But then my operations might be much more difficult because I have to do. Um, I lose all of this, the, the operations that might require some magnetic field dependence, for instance. <laughs> and so there's always a trade, right? Uh, there, there are many, many things required to get right in order to do a gate, and I can sort of, you know, run sliders up and down about which one is hurting me the worst uh, at any given time. So in, in practice, usually the thing that's hurting us the most in ions is just the, the uh, you know, how long we can keep a laser locked at a given frequency. So. Uh, and the next best thing, and the next worst thing is usually some sort of magnetic field fluctuation. Um, okay. T gate over T1. Uh, yeah, that would be like 10 to the minus 5. Sorry. <laughs> Had that backwards. Okay. Uh, so up till now, I haven't said a anything at all about ion traps uh, and how they work, and I'm, I'm really going to going to cruise through this quite quickly. I have one here. This is not a continuum ion trap. They're obviously not going to let me give you one of those. This is a trap I designed at Georgia Tech Research Institute. Uh, considering how much effort went into this, uh, I'm almost embarrassed to hand it to you because it, it just looks like a piece of silicon. Uh, trust me, uh, if you look really hard, there are lots of little features on here. Those are actually lines, gaps between metal electrodes. Uh, and you can see, you know, like metal electrodes in this picture uh, are the patches and then the dark gaps. Uh, there are lots of metal electrodes. This trap is just a cross-junction trap. And one of the legs has a big hole through it that goes all the way through the chip. You can pass that around. And if you get a good glint on it, you can sometimes see those features. But um, traps, uh, all the traps that we work with tend to, tend to be uh, linear traps in some sense, right? We create a section of, of space that is linear, one-dimensional, uh, where we can trap ions, right? And they, will, they can sit still, right? They can be cooled down so that they're not moving at all, right? And we're using uh, electrodynamic and electrostatic forces. I don't want to get into a long explanation of that. But what it creates is an electronic potential well. So, so you are confining this ion in all three dimensions using charge. Uh, it is not static. That's not possible. One of the one of the fields is oscillating, and that creates creates a place where the ions like to live that's linear. So, so in the trap in the upper left, two of those blades will have an RF field attached to them, and the other two will be grounded. And the ions will live in a nice long string, and we can use those those brass end electrodes to sort of push the ions back and forth, or to squeeze them together, or loosen them apart. Um, the trap in the center is continuum trap. If you bought time on one of our quantum computers you would be in that exact trap. Uh, it's just a long linear trap uh, with lots and lots of segmented electrodes that let, let us trap lots and lots of ions and potential wells and sort of move them back and forth and merge them and separate them. Uh, and then there's this sort of QCCD CCD architecture where we have junctions uh, connecting linear traps. And, and that's what you have there would, would just be like maybe a section of this, say, where we just have a single junction connecting four legs of a trap, and we can route ions around that way. Um, when we look uh, at, at a potential well uh, of a, that we create in one of these traps, um, you get this quantized uh, motional state, right? As, as your ion is, is in this potential well, it's a harmonic well, it's shaking back and forth, right? And, and those, those levels are quantized. Uh, we want to cool that ion down to, to absolute zero, right? We want it sitting uh, on that lowest rung of the well in order to, to do operations. Um, and then 
the, the other thing we can do is we have two ions in that well. We essentially have, have spring forces, right? We have, uh, they, they can move in, in common mode. Uh, they can also shake back and forth in a higher order mode. Uh, 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 and then there are also radial modes, right? They can go up and down and in and out. Uh, so the, the, the key takeaway here is that there is a communication channel between these two ions, and it is, it is that spring force between them that is provided by their Coulomb repulsion. Uh, and that is actually the channel that we use for, for creating entanglement between these two ions. Um, the other, so, yeah, and, and sort of the other takeaway here is that um, in order to, to actually run our quantum algorithm, we're storing ions in multiple wells in these traps and then actually sort of rearranging them in order to put ions together in registers where we do the quantum operations. Uh, and that's, that's the, the modality of how, this is the modality of how Quantinium is planning on doing ion trapping. I, I have more on that later. So here are a couple of pictures. This is sort of the first clue in my presentation maybe that optics are involved other than that first picture. Uh, you shine a laser on an ion uh, at the right frequency and it glows. So here's, I don't know how many are in there, a bunch of ions uh, in a single harmonic well uh, in a linear ion trap. Uh, that's the actual trap up there. That's the first ion trap I ever designed. Uh, and then, you know, here's, here's actually three calcium ions, uh, one of which is a different species. So, so the laser is only resonant with, with the two calcium 40s. It's not resonant with the calcium 44. So, so only the two calcium 40s are really glowing uh, very brightly. Um, this was supposed to be a video that kind of showed you uh, what's happening as, as we move an eye around an injunction trap, uh, much like the one you have there. The trap that's drawn here is not a, not a quantinium trap. I can't actually show you what those look like. The video is actually taken from, from one of our traps, and uh, I can't show you the video because it won't work, uh, but video is not often worth a thousand words in ion trapping because all you see is a dot move to the center, like in one frame. In the next frame, it moves down to there. Like, we can't actually capture the motion of the ion. It's too fast relative to the frame rate. Uh, so you just see a snapshot of an ion starting there and going there and then there and then there and then there. And, and so, yeah, we can move an ion around in these 2D arrays. Uh, here's another clue that perhaps optics are involved. Uh, if you haven't been to Paul's lab or, or any of these other labs, like, like uh, there's lots of optics there, right? I looked hard in this picture. I've been to this lab many times. I, I don't, there's no ion trap in this picture. This is just like some laser off to the side where we're preparing the lasers to take them over to the table where the ion trap actually is. And apparently, so Chris Monroe founded IonQ, and apparently this is the exact moment where he realized that ion trap computers solve unsolvable problems. At least that's what the website says. <laughs> He's a smart guy. You should go to his talks instead of mine because he explains this much better. So which ions can we trap uh, is an interesting question. Uh, uh, it, there, we, we can't trap all of these, right? We have to be, the, the, the DiVincenzo criteria apply. Like we have to be able to find uh, a qubit that we can prepare an initial state of, that we can do all those operations on. And I'll, maybe all of these have that, right? but maybe we have to understand a lot more about their state in order to, to make that happen. And people do spectroscopy on these things and try to find interesting ways to do things. Um, but there's a subset here where, where we have a very good model of what the, the state structure is going to look like uh, when we ionize them. And in particular, uh, this, this group two here, uh, when you take off one ion, you wind up, or sorry, when you take off one electron, when you ionize this thing, uh, you get something that has, you get an atom where the outermost electron is in the S1 half orbital. And therefore, the state structure looks like hydrogen. It's very predictable, uh, very easy to understand. Uh, you know, the selection rules are, are well understood. And so these guys are very easy to trap. So majority of the, the ion trapping groups will, will be using one of these. It, it turns out that ytterbium, uh, even though it's out of order, uh, has the same kind of thing going on, right? When you take off one electron, it, it acts like it has one in, in an S orbital. 
these guys have a similar sort of property. States are pretty easy to predict, and they look kind of hydrogenic in nature. Uh, this column here is much weirder, um, and it and and it, they basically can sort of write down ways in which those those atoms have have good states. The wavelengths are not very friendly, um, but aluminum is actually trapped at NIST, right? I don't know that there are any other groups that trap these others. These these guys have all been trapped one place or another. Uh, Mi Michigan and NIST. Uh, this is one that I would say just recently uh, uh, there was a paper published where somebody sort of pointed out how in doubly ionized lutetium you could figure out how to do the trapping operations, but no one's done it yet. Uh, the next thing to, to look at is what, what are the actual wavelengths required? Well, all these ones highlighted in blue are requiring UVC type wavelengths, right? Like less than 280 nanometers. That's that's not fun, right? The people who started working in cadmium said, "I'm not going to work in cadmium anymore. This is awful." Right? 226 nanometers. They were using, you know, two two second harmonic loops to generate that that wavelength, and, and it it was bad, right? So so when you put this up, you start to narrow in on on ions that look interesting. We've got calcium, strontium, barium, uh, and ytterbium. And so those four are really going to count for a majority of what people are doing in trapping. All right, I got to get moving here. Uh, <laughs> level diagrams, you see the wavelengths and states that are involved in two possible candidates, calcium and ytterbium. Uh, the, these, these, are, these are fast transitions, lifetime, uh, you know, on the order of a megahertz. So if we excite this, it decays very quickly. Uh, same over there with calcium. Uh, these states have very long lifetimes. These D levels uh, maybe on the order of seconds. So those make good candidates for, for instance, an optical qubit. I can say my zero state is in the ground here. My excited state, my one, is up here in the D level. If I excite this, lasts maybe a third of a second before it decoheres. Uh, in ytterbium, I have this, this hyperfine splitting, my, my ground state, because my nuclear spin is, is odd. Uh, it splits, and I can have this sort of microwave separation between my two levels. Uh, that's called a hyperfine qubit. Um, the, the key is that, that this diagram, if I only have these frequencies involved, these diagrams are, are pretty much complete. It's not really true of ytterbium. There's this other weird level over here that, we, that very, very infrequently becomes involved. But these are, are complete, right? If I only use these wavelengths, I'm going to stay in this space and I can pretty pretty well control uh, what operations are occurring. So, so let's look at basic Patani operations, and I'm going to try to speed this up a little. Uh, the first thing to understand is Rabi flopping. If I have a transition that's separated by a certain frequency, uh, and I shine a laser on the atom that has that frequency, I'm going to start flopping that transition. My probability is going to go around in a circle on the on block sphere. I'm going to I'm going to excite it, and then I'm going to de-excite it. Excited, it, de-excite it, it just goes on forever. Uh, if I send a pulse, if I perfectly time that pulse to be the exact right length, I can do what's called a pi, a pi flip, which is just taking it from zero and sending it to one, or if it's in a one, I send it back to a zero. That's my, that's my mechanism for doing single qubit rotations. Uh, if my lifetime of the state that I'm doing this Rabi flopping on is very short, I will get spontaneous emission. That is, at some point, when it's partly excited, it'll actually emit a photon uh, pretty close to the same frequency that I'm shining on it. Um, and, and I'll have some scattering away from this atom. In calcium, uh, you know, it's like a seven nanosecond lifetime. So that scattering rate is, is pretty high, megahertz, tens of megahertz. Uh, things get a lot more complicated when you come to the real world, right? Uh, we, have to, we have some magnetic field and that actually causes all those single levels to split out into multiple levels. Um, you know, S1 halves get a plus and minus uh, M levels. And, and up here, P1 half splits into these ones with higher spin, get more levels. Uh, so it gets complicated quickly. Uh, and then there are selection rules, right? Using polarization, I can pick which one of these uh, states are excited by my laser. Uh, this gets complicated uh, very, very quickly. Um, and, and there are lots of 
things we can do to, to deal with this. One is like if we apply a mixed polarization to this transition, then we can excite all these transitions at once. Uh, and, and, and it's hard to capture all of the, the possible dynamics of what we can do with this in, in so short a time. But I have a listing of all the, the pictures, essentially, of what the fundamental operations look like for calcium in this case. Uh, and, and the first thing we have to do is Doppler cooling, right? We needed to cool to the ground state. Doppler cooling uh, gets us most of the way there. Uh, and, and it, you know, Doppler kind of, kind of tips you off. We actually, uh, we actually illuminate the ion with a frequency that is, that is um, slightly less than the transition frequency. That is, the photons that are hitting the ion are slightly less energetic than the transition, which means that if the ion's moving towards me, uh, it's, it'll be, it'll see on resonance light and it'll absorb photons. Uh, and then when it scatters them, when it emits them, there'll be sort of random in distribution. And so it will slow down in the direction of, of the laser beam. Uh, the good news about being in a 3D harmonic well is your ion is bouncing around all over the place. At some point, it's going to be traveling toward your laser and it will slow down and energy will come out of it. So that argument works in both, you know, energy and momentum space. The, the, when we excite to the P1 half level, uh, it can also decay down here, right? It doesn't always decay down there. I think that the probability is like 10% or something like that. So we have to turn on this other laser and pump things back out of that state. Uh, but that's not so hard. That's a nice uh, uh, IR wavelength, easy to, easy to handle. Uh, sideband cooling is, is the way we get from, dot, you know, where we're limited in Doppler cooling, which might be 10 quanta or less. Uh, depending on, on the frequency, uh, where we, we have to individually remove each additional quanta of energy from this ion. And so we have, we have to use what's called a resolved transition, is one that's narrower in line width than the laser we're using, so that we can actually detune by exactly one quanta. That is, you know, if we're in the third level here, we actually excite this in such a way that it can only reach a state that is one less quanta of motional energy in this excited state. Um, and then to get back out of this, uh, we just pump it up into this high level and let it decay back down. And that there's some probability that we, that we stay in that state with a lower uh, motional excitation. Uh, but there's no probability of going back up, right? So we always remove some, some amount of phone, uh, you know, some amount of one phonon per loop. And we just have to pulse this over and over again. So we, we pulse it up, we wait a little while for it to decay, pulse it up again. But each, the, the trick is that each pulse gets a little bit slower as it gets colder. So this actually takes quite a bit of time. This is certainly the, the second most difficult thing to do in ions. State prep uh, in calcium uh, looks pretty similar to Doppler cooling, except uh, now we're using polarization selectivity, right? We excite only uh, circular polarization, left circular polarization. Uh, and so we preferentially make this transition to the left here. It decays down either direction, right? But if it gets here, it's stuck. This blue laser that I've drawn in isn't connecting to a state. Uh, so, so once the ion, once the electron gets to this state, it just stays there, right? And if it decays back down here, it just gets excited again. So eventually, if you do this long enough, you wind up in a pure state. And then we want to do a single qubit gate. So we just have this this laser that's on resonance with the transition between our two states and we send it a pi pulse. Uh, we have to perfectly control the amplitude, the frequency, the alignment, the polarization, all of that of that laser beam to get this pi pulse exactly right in order to do this transition. Uh, this we can usually do with like five nines of accuracy though. This is not especially hard. And finally there's readout, uh, which is that we pump this S to P transition on resonance. If we're in the one state, neither of these lasers is, is connecting this state to any other state, right? So if we're in the one state, it just doesn't see those lasers. It just stays there. But if it's in the zero state, it just repeatedly gets excited uh, and then scatters uh, uh, photons. And we can put a camera up above and measure those photons. So the final thing I haven't talked about and I'm not going to draw a diagram for is two qubit gates. There are a lot of way to do two qubit gates. Uh, these are definitely the hardest. Uh, generally, you know, some requirements are written there. We have to have beams that are crossing. 
Uh, they have to be uh, at different frequencies so that they create a delta k vector between them that is aligned with a mode of the two ions <laughs> at emotional frequency of those two ions, and they create a state-dependent force, right? They, they create a force on those two ions that depends on the internal states of those two ions. And, and there are a lot of ways of doing this, and they're all difficult to explain in one minute. So I'm going to move on. Uh, there's, there are huge requirements on this. In, in some cases, both ions have to be separated by exactly like one half of a wavelength, for instance, or, or multiple of that uh, in order to do the gate correctly. Uh, other, imp you know, the, the power is high. Uh, requirements on phase noise uh, are extreme. Uh, alignment is always important. Usually we have to have exactly the same amplitude on both ions from both beams. Uh, so that's, those are kind of steep requirements. And that's a picture of, of actually it comes from continuum of how the lasers are prepared to do that gate. Uh, each one of those little blue boxes is a, is a TASHG from, uh, um, that, you know, costs a lot of money. <laughs> so you put all that together, and we usually get something we call a compass plot, and Reiner Blot's group was even nice enough to put a compass rose up here. But you look down on a trap, and you see all these lasers coming in, and they all have polarization requirements. Uh, and on top of that, we have to add all these other things, uh, a vacuum chamber, all this has to be done at ultra-high vacuum, uh, cryo shield, windows, magnets. Uh, it's a big engineering problem. Uh, and that's for, for one gate, right? So now we put this trap in, and, and each one of these operations has to be done in potentially five different zones within this trap. So, so now we've got just, just a huge uh, number of optical beams we're trying to source. And this is our roadmap. I'm not going to talk about all the little words here, but, but that, was, that trap was just the one on the left, right? The next one is the, is the one that's an oval. We have not four zones, but eight. Uh, and then we go to these grids where we have a whole lot more modes, uh, uh, places where we want to do operations of registers, I guess is the right word. And then it, it just keeps getting worse and worse from there. We can't just keep sticking beams in from the edge and expecting uh, this to work, right? The beams are, are intersecting all sorts of things we don't want them to, and the traps are getting big. So I think maybe the only picture here that, that's worth mentioning is we don't envision doing that without some kind of integrated optics. So, so let's take some snapshots at some of these things. So, so the first thing to do is sort of give you a layout of what, where, where various systems live in the lab. Uh, this is kind of very grossly a scale model <laughs> of an optical table. And we put the electronics up high so that the heat doesn't come down here and wreck things. Uh, we've got some optical systems here in beam delivery to the trap, right? We've got some, some measurement optic down here. We're actually collecting the light from the ions. That's another optical system. Uh, maybe we have, you know, we certainly have this laser and signal conditioning. I'm not going to talk about that at all right now. I don't have time. Uh, and then uh, there's no four on here, but, but microfabrication is kind of a MEMS thing. That's optic-y. Uh, a lot of you are probably doing something like that. So... Uh, I'm also not going to talk about that. Uh, that's what I do most of my time on. Uh, so let's talk about beam delivery for a little bit. Um, this is a, a picture over at the left looking down on a trap with, uh, it's actually two pictures that are added together, right? One is showing you what it looks like when a laser is actually on uh, and is, is following that green line across and hitting these ions. And the second one is a, is a picture of, of an ion string. They have to be taken with different exposures. In order to see those ions at all, we have to do a background subtraction of a, of a dark frame, right, to get rid of all the scattering. And then we have to turn the gain on this camera, like, up to, to something very high. And we have to wait a very long time, like maybe a half a second or a quarter second or something like that, to see those, those on an ion. Depends on how big our lens is. Uh, but one thing to note here is, is look at all this stuff, right? Uh, and over here, this big glow... That's the laser hitting the ion trap, right, and scattering. Uh, for, for every photon that we send in in that readout laser beam, we might be collecting one in, like, one in 10 to the 10 or one in 10 to the 12 of those photons in our collection. Uh, and that's, we need a lot of spatial filtering in order to do that. If we look from the side, this is a kind of a creepy-looking picture. I 
I couldn't make it look any better. It looks very devilish. Um, you can see, you know, you're going to you're going to clip this Gaussian beam that you're sending in. It's an extremely ideal Gaussian beam you're sending in on the edge of this trap, uh, and, and where that light intersects with the trap is is giving us a lot of concerns, right? The first one is scatter. Uh, is some of that light getting up into our collection system? Uh, uh, and and then there's scatter in terms of decoherence, right? Is some of that light going and hitting an ion that it wasn't supposed to hit, causing it to lose its state? Uh, Laser-induced charging, these are ultraviolet wavelengths a lot. Metal surfaces, um, uh, are these, are, is this causing charging that's, that's gonna, gonna be bad for our ions? Any, any stray charge on the surface of this trap is very bad. And we get fringes, right? If we're trying to set the power exactly at these two points in the laser beam, and I've got some interference fringes coming off the edge of my trap, that gets a lot harder. That's sort of a picture right there. That shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who's who studied diffraction, uh, there's a lot to be said there, right? The, the beam that was sent into this model should have formed a waste right here, uh, but it didn't, right? It was shifted over by, by more than half a millimeter from where we think it should have been. This is kind of an extreme example. Um, and also it shifted in height, right? It might be it's almost five microns away from where we thought it should be in height. So. Uh, this actually takes quite a bit of time of studying to try to figure out, you know, how big can we make a trap? How big should we make a trap? Uh, you know, where can we, where can we put the ions in that beam in order to, to be able to understand uh, the, or stabilize the amplitude of the laser the best? Uh, so, beam delivery roadmap. This is where we are today. Uh, we have each laser coming in from its own fiber. And, and being laid on top of one another with these these mirrors so that they're only a little bit apart. Uh, and, you know, each one of those lasers is going to a different zone in the trap. That Each one of those optics has controls, right? Left, right, up, down, uh, all computer controlled, tons of degrees of freedom, not really scalable. Uh, maybe we want to go to something like an external pick, right? Where, where we've integrated all that into a single pick. We have amplitude control. Uh, all that built into the pick. And then we have a relay lens that relays that onto the trap. So we've gotten rid of all the, the controls, but then we've locked in uh, a lot of degrees of freedom and our, our optics better not have any distortion. And then the next level is something like this. I actually have a better slide. The next one is trap integrated photonics. Let's actually put, put the lasers into waveguides underneath our electrodes. Uh, then let's have grading out couplers we don't have to worry about the trap shaking anymore. Like when you put a trap on a cryo cooler, it, it can shake. Labs have vibration right here. The features that define where the ions are are the electrodes that are built into the same exact piece of material that the, the optics are so they don't, they don't move around. Uh, of course, this is difficult because now we're, we're integrating completely different things, electrodes and uh, optics into the exact same fab, and, and that just takes a lot more steps and, and has yield issues. This is kind of a timeline of what you will see if you look in the literature on this. Uh, people started working on this at MIT, I think back around before 2010. It took them a good six years to get a result where they actually had some light interacting with, with the ion that came from an integrated source. Uh, they were always using silicon nitride. I think every one of these is using silicon nitride. Uh, they they uh, started with friendlier wavelengths, so 674 is one of the transitions in strontium. Uh, uh, Zurich was using 729 nanometers. Uh, the interesting thing here about Sandia, even though this was kind of a terrible implementation, is they did it for a blue wavelength. Uh, that's not easy. There's no one else trying to do that, essentially, uh, actively, right? And, and our wavelengths are all blue, so... So we have to really advance the state of, of, of that technology to, to make this something that is useful to us. Uh, this, this experiment is actually a two-cubic gate, so it's actually doing the hardest thing. That's very exciting. So the final thing to talk about is, is measurement optics, uh, is how we do state detection. I showed you a plot earlier uh, of how we did this calcium. Uh, this is an example with ytterbium, slightly different modality, but 
similar concept, right? We shine, uh, we have a zero state and we shine on light that in this case doesn't interact with the zero state. It only interacts with the one state and, and this, uh, you know, repeatedly gets excited and emits photons. We stick some giant lens out here and a PMT uh, and, and if, the, if the ion is in the one state, we see photons. That's this distribution here. PMT counts uh, for each experiment we run. Uh, if the ion's in the zero state, we don't see zero photons, of course. We have dark counts. Uh, and in euterbium, uh, well, I'll mention that on the next slide. Uh, in euterbium, uh, there, there's two things that can go wrong. One is... Uh, or sorry, there's one main thing that can go wrong with ytterbium, which is there's off-resonant pumping, right? This, we're relying on the fact that, that, uh, that this state doesn't excite to this state, uh, but what happens very, very infrequently is this state excites to this one, right? This one can actually decay back down to the zero state, and so you can actually, during the process of readout, it's a very, very low probability, but not zero, that you'll actually switch the state over to, to the zero state, to the dark state. Uh, and, and the other issue here is that no matter how bright of a laser we shine in our ion, it can only fluoresce at a certain rate uh, that's, that corresponds to its own lifetime or about a third of that, say, uh, if we do it really right. So we're limited in how many photons we can collect in time. Uh, so the solution, of course, is to use the giganticest lens that you can possibly think of and collect as many of those photons as you're getting. Uh, even so, you... You know, we care about fidelity at the 10 to the minus 3 level. Uh, even at, you know, numerical apertures of 0.6, uh, uh, you know, we're getting collection efficiencies that are, that are only in the 10% in the range, uh, 10 to 15% range. Uh, that, that graph really isn't, isn't heavily in our favor. Um, the, remember, we're in a vacuum chamber here, right? It's, it's pretty hard to put these lenses into the vacuum chamber. Uh, there's lots of integration issues here. Uh, here's a couple of really big lenses. Basically, every single implementation you see in the literature for ion trap quantum computing, they're just using a giant lens that they've stuck outside the vacuum chamber. This is the one, you know, we paid a bunch of money to have that designed. Uh, that, one, that lens was made by Photon Gear. It was used in the experiment where they did the remote entangling of two ions uh, through an optical fiber. Uh, one in the upper left I designed myself. It's pretty awful, but it, but it made all those pictures you saw earlier. Uh, you know, these, these are a couple of projects I was fortunate to work on earlier in my career, which is designing an ion trap that actually had a dimple mirror in it. And so photons were collected and sort of roughly collimated away from the trap. It was a terrible idea. Don't do that. Uh, you have to fit the RF electrodes around it. That's what all those wiggles are. That was really hard to make. It didn't work very well. This was a better idea. This, this was a project I did with Griffith University where we actually made diffractive optics in the surface of the trap. Uh, and uh, same, same idea, collimated. That worked really well, but it's, it's very difficult to do uh, because you're trying to make uh, multi-level uh, optics. It all has to be in metal. Uh, it, it took a pretty remarkable effort to make that happen, uh, but it worked pretty well. Um, Okay, and then finally, integrated detectors, right? Somebody's like, well, let's just put the integrated detector right underneath the ion. Uh, this is difficult in, in basically every possible way, right? You have all these extra fabrication steps to, to make these detectors. Um, how do you spatial filter, right? Like, all those scattered photons I showed you earlier are going straight to the detector, uh, and, and the results you see show, like, really bad scattering or, or dark count rates. Um, you have issues of, of shielding your ions from the electrical signals that are required to, to control the detector, and then you have vice versa, right? You have to shield the detector from the electrical signals that are required to control the ions. Uh, and then temperature issues, right? So if you are you know, using a superconducting detector, you have to precisely control the temperature of your trap. That doesn't work so well. Uh, and um, this is just another integrated detector paper that came out uh, actually last week uh, from Sandia and, and had some, uh, what was interesting about this is they actually was the first trap that had this sort of idea of an integrated, or a transparent conductor integrated into it. Uh, that was pretty new. Uh, it solved a couple of those problems, but, but certainly not the, 
not the bat dark background rate. Uh, and that's it. Um, if you actually look, now that we're back to this slide, this is the actual optic that we use right now that takes the five beams and lays them really close together. So each one of these is going to a different zone in our, in our, in our uh, linear ion trap. Thank you. Magnetic field is usually fixed. There are other implementations where you actually can can adjust, you know, apply like microwave magnetic fields or magnetic field gradients in order to simplify the gate the gate optically. But yes, all of that. <laughs> I have a thousand uh, ions in this trap. You may want to bring uh, many pairs of them into some processing yes. station, apply the laser yeah. beam, then move them back to where they were. Yeah. Um, the, the most optimal thing is if you have a thousand ions, you have a 500 registers, right? And each time step, you put all you know 500 pairs together and do gates on them. Uh, that might not be achievable. Maybe we only have a small number of registers, and in each time step, you know, we have 10 registers. We put 10 pairs together, interact them, send them back, bring in another 10. That's more or less how a classical computer works. All of that has to be done within the coherence time, one second time? Uh, without error correction, yes. You know, error correction is, is another many hours of talks <laughs> that, that gives you some, potentially some resistance to that. Yes? So if I heard you correctly, uh, you said a single qubit gate that can be done with pretty high fidelity, you said that like, or low in fidelity of like 10 to the minus 5 or something. Yes. Like that. Uh, is there any kind of number for that on a two qubit gate? Uh, the paper that we just published um, from GTRI was, I think, 0.992. But that was, uh, uh, that was the, because they couldn't separate out the contribution from each individual operation in the process, that was the complete error. So that included state prep and measurement. Uh, so they, they, the error budget has them doing a, a two cubic gate that's pretty close to four nines. Yes? How do you get the ion in the trap in the first place? How do you get just like a single atom in there? Yeah, so uh, most groups just use a thermal source. So you just actually heat up a chunk of metal until it starts emitting atoms. Uh, and then you have a laser beam that excites the outermost electron in that atom and a second laser beam that, that causes it to eject that ionizes it, uh, and then at that, at that exact moment, uh, it starts seeing the, uh, the electric fields, right? And so it has to be basically at the center of the trap when it ejects that, that electron, and then it just stays there. We use, um, we use MOTs, actually. So we create a MOT of atoms and drop it onto the trap, uh, and, and then photoionize those, and that gets rid of the whole like thermal distribution issue. Showed that periodic table, and you said that some of the atoms are not uh, good for what you want to do. But even the ones that are good, like calcium or tritium, they have these uh, additional states that cause trouble, and you have to be aware of them. Yes. So, is there anything uh, that one can do with uh, artificial ions? Can you make a nanometer size artificial material that has the right properties so that you don't have to worry about all those extraneous uh, problems? Uh, I'm not aware of, I mean, people make, uh, you know, like Diamond Envy uh, is an example, I think, maybe of what you just said, uh, where you're essentially are creating an artificial atom. And, and they, they will have their own issues because, you know, they're in some crystalline matrix and they have a complicated uh, level structure uh, and are, are connected to a thermal bath. Uh, you know, the advantage of these ions is we can cool them down to absolute zero very effectively. Uh, yeah, I, I've yet to see anything that's, if something 
super simple like that existed, I think everybody would move to it. Yes? Work on embedding uh, atoms in frozen uh, noble gases. Huh. And apparently you can get pretty long lifetimes in there. But okay. I, I forget, I mean, as you said, there is some, there is some reason that maybe it's not obvious. Frozen no, noble gases happens. comes to mind, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I have not seen that. I'll have to look at that. No, I don't think you need to. I mean, I think everybody. <laughs> yeah. It's like single electrons, right? They, they trap them above uh, liquid helium-3, I think. Uh, sounds great. Not so practical. OK. No more questions? Yeah, quick questions. Yes. Uh, we, have, we also hear a lot about integrated photonics for neutral atoms. Is there, how would you compare and contrast the challenges of those two approaches. I mean, you have to have integrated electrodes, for example, for ion trapping. Yeah. So, so with atoms, I think you you don't have the the problem with dielectrics necessarily, um, and 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 charging is is not as serious a concern, right? I mean, obviously, it's going to create some interaction, um, but I, I've seen systems where they they essentially trapped. Planes of atoms, only you know, microns away from optical surfaces, uh, and and could get, you know, NA of 0.9 something collection efficiency, uh, and, and that would be nice. But atoms have their own problems. Uh, I, I'm not directly aware of any proposals I've seen to do uh, integrated optics with with atoms. I guess that's a lack of looking, right? They're usually using uh, uh, tweezers, right, with, that's, that are on a steerable array somehow, and then they're using, you know, just an interfered pattern of, of laser beams in order to create a 2D grid, and then they can use the tweezers to sort of move atoms among the nodes in the grid to create their initial atom array. Yes? Isn't it precisely that they just all the Entangled, unentangled, and all that. At the, at the end of at the end of the day, other than the short algorithm factorization of prime numbers, what other problems can you solve with this machine? Uh, so, I should send somebody else to answer that question. Uh, uh, there are some interesting sort of physicsy things that have been done in terms of simulating various icing models and, and stuff like that that are on the simulation side. All would be a much better reference for that than me. Uh, there, there are uh, there are a variety of other sort of postulated algorithms of interest. I, I really do not follow that closely enough to, to give a, an intelligent answer beyond that. So sorry. Compare the pros and cons between uh, atomic systems and the Trapped ions. Atom like trapped atoms? Yeah, or? Yeah, 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 just trapped ions and the, uh, trapped uh, atoms, yeah. Um, there have been some really compelling recent results on, on uh, trapped atom gates, right? I think the first even, even decent fidelity two qubit gate in a trapped atom was, was since 2010 uh, out of Mark Safman's group. Uh, it, it's, it's more difficult to, to implement. It. The main problem they faced uh, early on was just that their loading was probabilistic, right? They created this, this 2D array of trapping sites by interfering lasers, and they loaded atoms into it, but it was probabilistic. Some sites got one atom, some, most sites got none, some got two. Uh, and then, uh, and so that, they had to figure out how to flush that and get, you know, sort of a densely packed array of, of deterministically loaded atoms, uh, and that was demonstrated only within the last couple of years. Uh, and then the readout mechanism is, is really inefficient for atoms. Uh, their lifetime is, is excruciatingly short because these, these, the well depths are very shallow. Uh, your, your, you know, single atoms might only last seconds uh, in these wells before they get ejected. And when you have 100 of them, you know, even your heroic effort at vacuum chambers is going to keep you, those atoms around for seconds. Young optical engineer, and you wanted to break into the field of quantum <laughs> systems engineering. Knowing what you know right now, what would you recommend? Uh, 
I would recommend, like we hire optical engineers, uh, for regardless of whether you have experience in eye trapping. Get, get some lab experience absolutely anywhere <laughs> in, in this building uh, so that you can prove that you're, you're a decent person to work with in a lab and, and you would be interesting, you know. The academic curriculum you get here is very well suited to the requirements we have. Uh, and, and just, uh, we were good at this at GTRI. I think we're working on it at Continuum is like, we just want to hire people who've demonstrated capability and have great knowledge uh, in a lab. And then you can, you can learn the other stuff quickly. I just want to say before we have one last round of applause and commemoration of your, your homecoming, we have a certificate of appreciation. Okay, thank you. And, uh,